time. Boom. Colin Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, calling Rick Fire in that small little village somewhere in the middle of America. The toddling town where it's supposed to get four or five inches of snow tonight. Get out! Really? Yeah, you're not having oh. that in London, I'll bet. Oh, no. hell no. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> hell no. Well, uh, you're, if you're wondering where you are, you're at History Happy Hour. And uh, we'll wait a moment for people to join us and just say that we're here every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours Facebook and YouTube pages. You'd think I'd memorize that after uh, 37 weeks, but I'm still reading it off my iPad, yeah. And all of our broadcasts are also archived on the History Happy Hour webpage. You know, we should have a sponsor, right? Brought to you by Palmolive. (laughs) But sadly, we don't. But But everybody, please check in with us and let us know where you're uh, coming from. We got Rob from Kings Park, New York. I think that's not terribly far from where our guest is from. And Valerie from Normandy. And who else do we have here? Uh, uh, Chris and Jean Templin from Hershey. Yeah. George is in Rhode Island, as usual. And, uh, you know, John, Jean, Ken, all you guys, welcome. And we're glad that you're here. And I think we've gotten to a critical mass. I think so. So, uh, Cal, now that Cal's here, we've got a critical mass and, and Thomas. So, uh, it's time, Chris. <laughs> And the bar, the bar is, is open. open. What are you drinking today, Chris? Uh, I'm going to start out with a really nice Santa Million, and then uh, I have a beer for backup. All right, excellent. I'm just basic basic beer. But uh, what is on tap for today, Chris Anderson? Tap, I'm really um, I'm really excited. Uh, we're going to be talking with David Michaelis, uh, and he has written a new biography of Eleanor Roosevelt, appropriately called Eleanor. Uh, David is the New York Times bestselling author of Schultz and Peanuts. Uh, and the biography of N.C. Wyeth, which won the Ambassador Book Award for Biography. He has written, and uh, his articles have appeared in Vanity Fair, American Heritage, Life, Reader's Digest, American Scholar, and Best American Essays. Well, let's and bring him in. That's yes, his, please yeah. do. There you go. Hi, David. Hi, guys. How are you doing? I've got my 40 Winks Motel water glass all set to go. Woo. All right. Woo, living the high life. <laughs> living the high life at the 40 Winks, yep. That's right. well, just try to, avoid, try to avoid catching 40 Winks during the show, please. We would all appreciate your wakefulness uh, throughout the hour. At least most of it. Most of it. <laughs> Mr. Anderson. Oh, well, great. No, are, David, I are, just want... I wanted to say that we're very excited to have you here. Um, right before the show came on, I saw that uh, there was a review of uh, Eleanor in The Guardian, and as that is the official newspaper of record here in the Anderson household, they said very nice things, and I agreed with them all. So, Lovely. A wonderful yeah. review, the kind that I maybe sat in this, getting 40 winks in this very room and imagined such a review, <laughs> and then realized waking up, no, no, that was just a <laughs> it, it, It's very, it doesn't happen that they're that nice. Uh, yeah. That, and and actually, the thing about that review is it was a review. It wrote about it. It discussed the book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and not just the life, which is great. Yeah. So, well, speaking of the life, um, we're going to get into into the weeds. But um, one of the one of the great the book is full of wonderful stories, of course. Uh, but one of the ones that I really love is um, you talk about a cartoon, a Herblock cartoon, um, and it came out uh, on Eleanor Roosevelt's seventieth birthday. It's a mother son uh, taking a boat across New York Harbor and seeing the Statue of Liberty there and the mother looks down at her son and says you know do you know who that is and he says of course I do mom that's Mrs. Roosevelt and, and I just boy you know when I, I was reading along in the book and that reading that story really caused me to stop um, and think about what is it about this woman who's basically born late Victorian era how does she become so ubiquitous in America by 1954? What is it about her personality and what she accomplishes that makes that cartoon so effective? Well, I, I mean, the book, uh, the arc of the book that I immediately saw that I had to somehow connect was uh, Jane Eyre Becomes Lady Liberty, sort of the, the, the arc of it. This, this Victorian era, Edwardian era orphan, Eleanor orphaned at age 10, 
does become by the end a liberty like figure a lady liberty like figure um, and i think she was recognized and recognizable uh by the time that cartoon was published in the 50s because she was a figure representing international universal human rights i mean that that by then the doc the document the declaration of human rights which she had chaired uh, the member states of the UN had voted on and accepted by 1948, created a template for what a human being is and what rights a human being has. Uh, she did something with that uh, commission and with the UN that no one else had ever done. And so in that sense, she was utterly unique in her standing in the world. But as the president's widow, as a figure unlike any other woman, there was no woman comparable to Eleanor Roosevelt. There was no private mm -hmm. citizen. Uh, who was known a, a, around the world. Uh, she was a figure somewhat like Gandhi, somewhat like uh, um, Charlie Chaplin in a way, somebody like uh, Muhammad Ali or uh, Nelson Mandela, who was simply the, the largest form of expression of the human desire for freedom, for, for, for justice, uh, for, the, for, the, for the, big, the big important issues and big important needs of human beings. And in America, I think she had done something that certainly no other first lady had ever done, which was she embodied the government. She made you realize and made you feel that the government belonged to you. Your government belonged to you. She was mm -hmm. a sort of proxy figure in between you and your government. There, and that also made her accessible uh, to, to people, her, her constant mobility, her, uh, her literally on the ground, in touch um, footpath to your to your world, uh, to, you know, you went to see the president. People people came to see FDR, but Eleanor went to you. She yeah. came to you, and that, that's really the difference, I think, between the other first ladies um, and even the great ones and Eleanor. She she really got on the ground and uh, and made herself more ubiquitous, even than the um, you know the sort of joke of George Washington slept here. Uh, I mean, El Eleanor really did sleep <laughs> there, or, or pass through. She yeah. really didn't sleep much. Um, she barely knew there were 24 hours in a day. She just kept right on going. You know, the, the, we could go all day on Eleanor Roosevelt cartoons, and, and we don't have any other visuals, but bringing that up, there was one I saw uh, uh, online uh, in the last few days of an army officer talking to his men, and he's got a letter in his hand, and he says, uh, next time one of you has a problem, please bring it to me. Don't write to Mrs. Roosevelt. <laughs> and, and that's the, you know, the, the sense of, of how, how much she meant to people. Um, and when you say there wasn't anybody else like her, there still isn't, I don't think. I don't yeah. think there's anybody else in American history that comes close to that sort of um, connection. No, and there was, uh, from among world figures, especially uh, female, uh, empowered female figures in the world, really it's the Queen of England, uh, who we now see in a different light because of a series like The Crown. Um, but at the time, people didn't see the Queen of England quite the same way as someone who was free of the institution so much. Eleanor freed herself of institutions right. and became a one by one by one individual person, a person dealing with the individual. I, can I can I follow up on that one, Chris? Or um, just this once? Just this okay, once. just this once. And I also I do also want to say we have some questions coming up, and we are going to get to them. We're going to make a real effort uh, to get to questions. But I just wanted to sort of put this very broadly to you, uh, David. Um, um, Eleanor Roosevelt. As I was reading your book. Uh, and uh, I was thinking that it's such a familiar story, and yet there's so many mysteries in it. Um, but it's really, there's two lives. Eleanor Roosevelt has both a public life and a private life. And they are both sort of staggeringly uh, sprawling, complicated, uh, unconventional. And I wondered which one appealed to you or did you find most compelling uh, and why? Her private life is uh, so full of people, so many of them named with the same name, that I took great relief in her public life because right. I would then be at least rele released from the, the Roosevelt family names. No, I, I actually found her private life um, incredibly compelling because of the uh, uh, amount of written, the, the amount of written material that she herself left that does attest to where she was at specific times and how she was thinking. Is gives you a an inside track that m many figures just didn't you know you can't have with most people. Uh, 
it also was compelling because she transcended it. She was always mm. transcending the world that she was now stuck in. By 10 years later, you'd see an entirely different amount of velocity in Eleanor Roosevelt. You'd see a different ability. You'd find that she, a skill that she had developed, for instance, in dealing with her drunken, uh, formerly, um, uh, uh, you know, formerly athletic uh, uncles, her 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 mother's brothers who had been tennis champions in the in the 1880s by the 1890s were falling down drunk were getting in scrapes in the tenderloin district in manhattan and eleanor was sent frequently as a young person as a 15 16 70 year old teenager to bail them out i mean it was eleanor who who went to court with them when they were uh had had suits thrown at them for for assault and various other things that their alcoholism was getting them caught up in and the skills she developed in dealing with those men, in dealing with those courts, with the system, uh, at, uh, you, you see later on, you see it, that's something that she builds on. She always found a strength within herself from each thing, each crisis she passed through, and it's that strength that shows up the next time. So there's a, there's a gratifying building uh, of a human being, uh, a becoming of a human being, which every biography really is, but in Eleanor's case, it's dramatic and it's dramatized that because each each section of her life is a has cause and effect on the next section. And what she learns as first lady of the state of New York in visiting prisons, in visiting hospitals, in, in be, being suspicious of what she's being shown, uh, even per FDR's instructions, you know, lift the lid on the on the, uh, the the pot on the stove. Don't just accept them telling you it's 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 all good. Be sure you see, you look in, you see, you count the number of uh, 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 undergarments on the line behind the house, etc. Um, those things came up then in her as eyes and ears for the president uh, when she began going to look into New Deal projects, New Deal uh, camps, CCC camps. She began to know how to see and what she was seeing and how to in fact, for her, uh, relate, how to relate to people, how to relate to men, how to, how to go into a camp. She did it right away with the Bonus Army, the second Bonus Army in Washington, and won them over uh, in, within minutes, discovering that they all knew the same songs from the First World War, and all of which they, be, I mean, which they began to sing. And the men all gathered around this, this figure of, you know, a patrician woman, tall, well-dressed, um, but not plainly dressed, um, but not, um, not in any way capable of bringing anything more than their best hopes to the president. And yet when the headlines appeared in the Washington papers the next day, it was, uh, you know, Hoover sent the army, Roosevelt sent his wife. And it was an entirely different approach to how do you connect with, with, with the people. So, so David, I mean, we, we, you just touched on a, a lot of what um, I was going to kind of mention, but just so people have a clear baseline, um, very briefly, what what is her childhood like? I mean, it's just, it's safe to assume that she is coming from a somewhat troubled background. Uh, and what would be kind of those moments just pre FDR? You think that are the most formative of or you know so kind of significant? Well, Eleanor's childhood was absolutely Dickensian. Uh, it was a <laughs> childhood of shame and humiliation and sadness because her mother, a ambitious, socially ambitious. Uh, and somewhat marginalized figure, the Hall family, um, Anna Roosevelt Hall was considered one of the most beautiful women in New York, but her family was the, one of those marginal, was families that was becoming marginalized as the Astors and Vanderbilts and Morgans um, changed New York City into, uh, you know, into, into the Gotham City of, of the railroads and, and, uh, and oil. And, and there was a, an entirely new, uh, class of wealth that families like the Roosevelt's and the Halls were slipping down and away from. And Eleanor's mother was hanging on, in a sense, and really trying to establish herself. And that, that mission to make herself into a social leader le left her continuously contemptuous of this um, young, small child, plain but quite pretty, actually, um, by, by the standards of the day. She, Eleanor's uh, looks were commented on in magazines very favorably. And her mother saw in her, though, a sort of stern, solemn, old-fashioned, fussy, um, n not a very nice, not a very 
not a good reflection, not a perfect reflection of herself, which is what she wanted to see. And she demeaned Eleanor, calling her granny, a nickname that she brought out frequently, Eleanor wanting only to sink into the floor when her mother shamed her like this in front of others, including actually Franklin Roosevelt's family when they went to visit. Um, there was a much larger tragedy in Eleanor's childhood, which was her father's drinking and her father's alcoholism and her father's inability to find a, a role for himself in the world. Uh, and as Theodore Roosevelt's younger brother, that was a tough place to be. It was a hard thing not to be as uh, <coughs> successful in ways that Theodore Roosevelt already was uh, as a young man, the young cyclone assemblyman in, in Albany uh, at the age of 25. But the Roosevelt family suffered tragedies, um, uh, the death of Theodore Roosevelt's first wife, the death of their mother, uh, and, and by the time Elliot and Anna uh, were married and Eleanor was in her fourth or fifth year, they, they, they suffered a, a terrible collision at sea, which cast all sorts of um, more doubt on Elliot Roosevelt's masculinity and his, his ability to function in the world, uh, a, a malicious you know, uh, um, California railroad magnet um, ca caused him a great deal of trouble during this collision of two ships one of which the Rose steamships, the, one of which the Roosevelt's was on, by creating a rumor that he was a coward and that he, he had sort of like, like a, almost like a Conrad short story that he'd gotten into a, a lifeboat um, because he was being cowardly. In fact, he was actually being quite um, heroic and quite um, doing, doing his duty. Um, Eleanor took the blame in a way for that episode and it was typical of the kind of things that happened to her in her, uh, in her childhood the really extraordinary moment, there were two moments really to sum this up. One is that her mother died, Eleanor was nine, her younger brother died. Both those deaths were from diphtheria, New York being a, a world of, of diseases and, and uh, unregulated, uh, um, there, there were very, very few cures, very few, n no, no, uh, no vaccines for smallpox diphtheria. Uh, and Eleanor's father's alcoholism took two wrong turns after he had broken a leg, including a, a period in which he became a junkie. He was addicted to, to laudanum in addition to, um, to, to his alcoholic um, dive. He, he brought himself even further down through opiates. And during that time, father to child uh, on, a, on a housemaid. And all of that was somewhat, Eleanor was somewhat uh, protected from, but it also uh, was, she was fully aware that, that her, her life was over in the, in the way she'd known it, when by 10 years old, she had lost her father too. So mother, brother, father, all within 19 months. And then she went to orphaned with a younger, one younger brother, she went to live with her uh, grandmother uh, up the Hudson, which had its good points. It also was challenging. And I think she learned a lot in having to live in other people's houses. But it was really the two things, it was the going abroad to school and learning how to think for herself under the tutelage of a quite charismatic uh, school teacher, a woman named uh, Marie Souvest, who took international students in a um, boarding school in London and turned them into independent women, thinkers, uh, w women who might function in some way or other outside the norms of, uh, of debutantes and, uh, and, and uh, housewives and, and so forth. She, Eleanor, returned from one of those years abroad and a very sadistic one, uh, aunt of hers, uh, Aunt Pussy, uh, let her have it one day in Maine during a um, social season where out of jealousy and pique and spite, she let Eleanor know all the details of her father's uh, final years, including this illegitimate half-brother that she had, including this um, uh, mistress and, 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 and really horrific death of Elliot Roosevelt's on 100, West 103rd Street where he had thrown himself out a window and just before his final breaths was called, according to Aunt Pussy's version, calling for Eleanor and, and where, you know, where, where is she? And making this child of 15 utterly just unmoored from her past now because if she had not known, she had thought of herself as her father's favorite and, and, and that she and her father had had a at least a, a bond, a set of communication skills that, that um, actually Eleanor repeated later, but that really convinced her that she knew her dad. Now she felt she didn't know him at all and had not known anything. And I think that moment cut her off from her childhood and also pushed her toward resolving to be the kind of good figure that we think of when we think of young Eleanor Roosevelt, 
uh, in order to compensate for her father's badness. You know, there was a sort of, I'm going to show them. And, and Eleanor did. And she, um, she became a sort of model of virtues uh, as she went through the motions of becoming a young you know, woman in society in, in her debutante year. But then it was that Franklin Roosevelt coming along, she joined forces with him very instinctively, finding a great deal of stability in his life uh, on the Hudson River with his mother and just out of Harvard. Uh, she exposed him to her own work that she had begun through the Junior League in the settlement houses in Rivington Street, the Lower East Side. But she also, I think, made herself into a figure of, um, she, she wanted always to be worthy of Franklin Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And the way she did that was by being useful. And this was a kind of constant theme for her of how she would get someone to love her was by being useful to them and by serving them and doing things and doing things for other people because she genuinely did care. I mean, the, the, her helping and her, her usefulness was out of a genuine uh, compassion and caring that remained, of course, a signature for her all the way through her life. So I, I was, uh, you said Dickensian in her early life. When I was reading the book, I was thinking of the first number in Hamilton, uh, where, you know, it's basically all these horrible things keep happening, 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 and yet somehow the person emerges from that. And you, you touched on that, that part of that emergence is her relationship with, with Franklin Roosevelt. And um, we had an early question, two early questions here and that, that touch on that. Um, and they are, uh, I'm going to put them up one after another. You can take a look at them both and then sort of address this topic uh, holistically. But uh, uh, um, Rob Musial says, did Eleanor have a loving marriage with FDR or did she view FDR as a means to accomplish her own ends? One could reverse that and say, did FDR view Eleanor as a means to accomplish his ends? And at the same time, uh, Doug McCord asks a question which might not seem related, but I think is, is it true the Roosevelts had separate houses in Hyde Park? I mean, this is not your everyday marriage, your storybook no. marriage, and yet it's a pretty spectacular relationship nonetheless. So I think that um, the idea that she would have her own ends early on um, is um, is interesting because I don't know what those would be with the exception her ends would be to serve Franklin early. Uh, she didn't begin to have, and her even her ends as she set forth into what could have been called her early political education um, in New York State were, were somewhat, on, mostly for the most part, on his behalf although she was working on the women's side of things pretty quickly. Franklin's polio, which uh, struck him in 1921, did change their lives a great deal more even than Franklin's relationship with Lucy Mercer, a, a love affair that began in 1917 with Eleanor's social secretary and continued for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And then when Eleanor discovered it, um, they made an agreement that they would remain married, but that he would never see her again and that they would go on in some ways. It, it, their relationship at that point in 1918, um, during the First World War, when Franklin was Assistant Secretary of the Navy and Eleanor was working in the Red Cross canteen at Union Station, um, had reached a point where I think they had realized that they were chronically unable to make each other happy and that their happiness was not going to be found in an, in an intimate relationship, uh, although they did go by then they had six children and they did go on to have a family that saw itself as a family, continued as a family, and was broken up much more by polio. I mean, Franklin and Eleanor's children felt very, I think, in their records of their childhood, they were very candid about their parents, but as, as, a, as a thing that broke the family into, into different parts, polio and their different responses to it was really much more the thing than either Eleanor's political aims or Franklin's romantic life, or extracurricular romantic life. I think that the understanding they always had, it began when they first met, was they were both actually kind of, they were both as teenagers oddballs. I always thought of it as like a compact of oddballs. They didn't, neither of them connected with their peers. They didn't connect as children with, it, with, with friend groups in ways uh, that would have made them charismatic or, or socially popular. They both were on the edges of things, on the fringes of things. And it was when they began to have a political life 
uh, when Franklin began to have a political life, that he became actually very attractive. People always think of Franklin as the pretty one and Eleanor as the quote unquote ugly duckling. But in fact, Eleanor was very charismatic when they met. She was the niece of the President of the United States. She had beautiful blonde hair. She had beautiful blue eyes. She, they sparkled when she smiled. She had a, a, had a sense of, of uh, radiance uh, at times, but she was overwhelmed by a kind of sadness and melancholy um, from, from her own private life that she never quite escaped. So she also didn't photograph very well. But Franklin's uh, charisma, his charm, his, his effervescence, his, his champagne quality uh, that Churchill uh, later um, talked about, all came from being in touch with people and being a, a public figure uh, in a way that um, he loved the attention. He loved, he came alive when, when he had a, an audience and Eleanor was just the, the reverse. Um, their marriage um, separated in the 20s into two very productive side by side. I thought of them as kind of cottage colonies because Eleanor's house, uh, the co little cottage at Stone Cottage at Val Kill was about nine miles away from, sorry, uh, three miles away from the big house at Hyde Park that Franklin had grown up with and that indeed his mother continued to live in. And that when Franklin came to Hyde Park, back to Hyde Park as governor or as president, he stayed in the big house, he stayed in his bedroom there and Eleanor would return to her bedroom there and they always considered it their home base and the children very much considered it their home base. But Eleanor's life began to take form at Valkyll with other political women, and as she got older uh, and as time went on and during the presidency and a relationship she began with an AP reporter, Lorena Hickok, it was her own refuge. It was a, it was a, it was a hideout, but it was also a place where people uh, from then until the end of her life, a lot of political activity um, was always going on around Valkyll. She had a, um, a furniture uh, factory that she, created with her, one of her close friends, Nancy Cook, a, a uh, woman who, with her partner, Marion Dickerman, had uh, introduced Eleanor to New York politics, to the women's division of New York politics. And uh, with Nan Cook, she developed this furniture factory that sort of fell into New Deal ideals and, and hired local people, artisans and so forth. And she, with the other woman, Marion Dickerman, uh, they, the three who lived in Valkill, um, she started a school, uh, bought a school in New York, Todd Hunter School. They both invested in it, and that was the school that Eleanor was teaching in when uh, she became First Lady. So, so, David, do you think that FDR, as we know him, or his, he's come down through history, that he could have been the president he was without Eleanor? No, and I think he knew it. I think that's, I mean, a part, part of his... Part, part of his uh, uh, view of himself as he fell in love with Lucy Mercer and as Eleanor and his mother, Franklin's mother and Franklin and even Louis Howe, all tried to make sense out of how this relationship was going to go on, uh, even though they, uh, Franklin was clearly in love with Lucy uh, and uh, had betrayed Eleanor. If Eleanor would stay in the marriage and, and both uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt and Louis Howe uh, helped her get to a place, I think, where she could see moving forward with Franklin, it was partly because he was going to stretch his life on the iron frame of Eleanor's character, her conscience. I mean, this is someone who, who was dedicated to facing things, to seeing things for real, to not denying them, to not turning away from them. Franklin was a, a born deceiver in a political and strategic sense He'd grown up with a very overbearing mother, an only child, who figured out how to get his mother to do what he wanted and to get what he needed by going kind of around the side of her and figuring out how to maneuver so that she would never feel as if he was actually deceiving or lying to her, but that he could maneuver her into a position where his white lie was going to get him what he needed. And that was a standard interpretation, I think, of FDR among his biographers. That, that you saw this. But when you see it in context of Eleanor, you see how hard it would be for them to really get along as intimates with each other. They never lost respect for their fundamental values as Roosevelt's, as, as Democrats, as, as patriots. Uh, their love of country, their love of, of 
an actual caring about what happened to people uh, was genuine and um, symbiotic and, and, and also fed into their politics and the policies of the Roosevelt administrations in ways that, that became crucial, I think. Uh, you can't see Franklin, I think, really without Eleanor at his side becoming the president he became. Um, we have a, I'm going to bring in another question from our audience. Um, you touched on, on uh, Lorena Hickok, Hick, as she was known to Eleanor. And Libby Meyer wants to know, could, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, she is a, a really, that really starts around the time of the election, right, in 1932? Yeah, yeah um, I mean, the important thing about Lorena Hickok, I think, is that she was a, a professional who was the star AP reporter of her day. She had covered the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. She had uh, broken scoops on the front pages of newspapers across the country. She herself had suffered a childhood not unlike Eleanor's, even more cruel in some ways. Her father, an alcoholic, had uh, abused her badly. And uh, when uh, Lorena Hickok's father finally died, uh, they asked Lorena Hickok, someone in the hometown asked Lorena Hickok what should be done with the body and um, her father's remains, and the answer was send him to the glue factory. She had no, absolutely no um, love lost uh, for her upbringing, and she wanted nothing more than to make a life for herself, and was doing that extremely successfully when she met Eleanor and fell in love with Eleanor. Now, the thing about Lorena Hickok is that Eleanor loved her immediate, not, not immediate, not love at first sight, but when she fell in love with her during the campaign, she was all in. And I think the thing to understand about her is that she wanted all her life to find a one and only, an, an, an other that she could love, that she could feel was lo that loved her as she loved the other who was, she just didn't feel that with Franklin. She had felt it with her father. Uh, she had understood that with, in, with her school teacher, Madame Suvest, she understood with Nancy Cook and Marion Dickerman who were more overtly lesbian, that, that there was a possibility for intimacy between women. But she never identified herself um, either, well, in any sense, as a lesbian overtly or, or in any sense, um, in, in any record that she left. But she fell in love with Lorena Hickok. And their letters, which are, anyone can go in and read at the Hyde Park uh, presidential, FDR presidential library, are impossible to read without seeing two people falling in love with each other and and having a sexual an erotic a absolutely free relationship with one another that went on for about four years in its sort of hot and heavy phases and that is very touching and sweet and lovely and also somewhat tortured because they could never find time to really be with each other as they wanted to be and as Eleanor's life as first lady got ever more complex the uh, New Deal itself became ever more complex, and Lorena Hickok actually gave up her professional duties as a reporter to join the New Deal and to go out on the road and report back to uh, Harry Hopkins and, 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 and the Roosevelt administration on the conditions on the ground around the country, a kind of reporting that, that she was extremely good at, uh, that she and Eleanor were drift, you know, drifted apart quite naturally as, um, as lovers, but they remained I think through the rest of both of their lives, or well, Lorena Hickok died uh, later than Eleanor, but there was a constant sense of loyalty and uh, friendship and, and closeness there. Um, and I think the thing about Lorena Hickok also is that Eleanor was able to learn things from her that she was putting into right into practice. I mean, she through Lorena Hickok's through her relationship with Lorena Hickok. She became the first first lady to have press conferences in the White House uh, for women reporters. She developed in her letters every night to, to Lorena Hickok a voice that became in Lorena Hickok's ear the voice of the first lady talking to a friend and she suggested that she do a column. It was then uh, proposed by a syndicate that wanted a competing column to a there we go, My Day by Eleanor Roosevelt began in 1935 and the syndicate wanted a you know, a, a competitor, Alice Longworth, Roosevelt, Eleanor's rivalrous cousin, Theodore Roosevelt's oldest daughter, was then about to start a column, and they thought it would be a great idea to have Eleanor compete with that. Eleanor immediately left her cousin in the dust by developing a voice that women 
by the <laughs> millions eventually found ex like a neighbor talking across a fence or a neighbor telling you what she was doing that day. And Lorena Hickok was the one who helped Eleanor find, I think, this connection to a much wider audience, a much bigger, bigger uh, numbers of people and regular people and people who she never would have had a chance otherwise to know or to communicate with. And it was Lorena's, you know, sort of grittiness and her, her compassion and her, 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 her eyes on things that helped. She was sort of, she was Eleanor's eyes and ears and legs the way uh, Eleanor was to Franklin. And, and you know, I, I just want to say as, as a writer, um, Eleanor Roosevelt puts pretty much everybody to shame. So she, uh, she, it's one thing to say, as you did, David, she, she wrote a column. Okay, she wrote My Day six columns a week for 25 years. I mean, you know, I think if I write an op-ed piece every couple of weeks, I am I'm really steaming out there. And she is, she is churning it out. Yeah, and she missed four days when the president died in 1945, April 12th. Can't to use April that excuse 16th. again. <laughs> yeah, and and we, I think we'd actually see it today as more of a live blog, uh, because it's her thoughts at, in real time as things are happening, and it appeared regularly. The syndication was a was a bit of magic of the 30s, um, along with radio, that was bringing these voices to people very quickly in ways they never had had before. It's hard to remember now. Um, I always think of this with Franklin Roosevelt. We, um, it's not just the, you know, the, the, that the pictures, got, the pictures got small. It's that at the time, FDR and Eleanor were, little, were seen by fewer people than today would see anybody comparable. Um, they would, when they appeared in a town, it was as if, um, you know, it was, it was as if um, a piece of Mount Rushmore had just suddenly become active. They, they were such legends. They were so little seen uh, by people, um, except let's say in a given week on the newsreel. Um, you just didn't have this 24 hour minute to minute exposure to celebrities. It was beginning, of course, to be more and more that way. And the radio culture was creating a new culture of closeness. FDR's fireside chats are all about getting, getting close to, um, to people with his voice. Eleanor did the same with her image. She learned how to smile. She learned how to be herself. She learned how to how to wave and, 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 and connect with people. But she particularly learned how to listen. And, and that was one of the great skills, I think, that she brought to, to the job of First Lady in addition to mobility, uh, was actually going into places and not just you know, listening for what she wanted to hear, listening to what they really were saying and, and actually taking action on it. And I think that's why that cartoon um, of the, uh, the corporal saying to the soldiers, you know, write to, write, write, write to me if you've got complaints, not to Mrs. Roosevelt, because when she would see, visit soldiers during World War II in hospitals, she would take their phone numbers and call their wives and mothers at home. Uh, she would take a list home with her and connect mm -hmm. with people and send things. Do you have a message that you need taken somewhere? And she would be a sort of, um, you know, uh, universal post office for, for, for GIs. And uh, I, I, the way she connected, Bill Clinton had a had a magic of remembering things over weeks, people's names and so forth, that was well known at the time. Eleanor had this going on for years. She would remember people's, that she would meet someone later, 10 years later, oh, I remember, I met you on Iwo Jima. You were the boy who, mm -hmm. astonishing memory for people and their names. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in her later years, she, did, she would forget and someone would say to her, did you know that? She said, no, I've never, I can't possibly remember everybody. But she, for a long time, from the 30s, through the 40s up to the 50s, she did have this magic with people, and uh, they, they never forgot it. A meeting with her was, a, was something they never forgot. So, David, I, I, one of the things that the, there's so much I want to ask you about, but um, in the interest of, like, kind of covering some of the bases with our questions, I, I want to turn a little bit now to, to post-war. Um, and in de December 1948, um, she shows up at the United Nations, and she gets a standing ovation. Now, I should say that she's the only person that's ever been so honored to get a unanimous standing ovation from an international body. Um, what had she done and what was her involvement in the creation of this that, that wound up with her getting such, such a high honor? Well, one of the collective memory uh, holes at the moment 
we're getting so far away from World War II, um, we're even getting down to, if have we lost our last veteran um, actually walking the earth? I think we're pretty close to we're not having We're getting closer, any, but we have a few. We, we have not quite. Two, we're not quite at the Confederate, the last Confederate general type moment. But, no. but what we've forgotten is how people experienced the years just after the war, after um, VE Day and after VJ Day, which was the an absolute abhorrence that anything of that scale could ever happen again. So how would you stop war? Well, one of the ways, and by, by um, there's a wonderful book by David Nassau right now um, uh, out about the years in which displa- hundreds of millions of displaced, tens of millions of displaced people uh, were, were uh, in different place camps, different places around the globe. The last million, I think it's called, right? Yes, exactly. And, and the, um, the idea that we, a war would ever take place again was abhorrent. And so this new fledgling institution, the, U, the United Nations Organization, as it was called, UNO, United Nations Organization, chartered in, in, in uh, San Francisco in early 1945, was having its first meeting in London. And Eleanor then went on with as, as um, representative to the meetings in Geneva, where she headed up as chair the commission that would create a document, a Magna Carta, a declaration uh, that would acknowledge what a human being was, first of all, would, would, would figure out what is a person and what are their rights? What are your rights and my rights? How do people have rights? Who is going to grant them these? What are these rights? And uh, do they have the right to be married? Do they have the right to air, clean air and water? Do they have the right to uh, live in, do they have the right to be stateless or must they be uh, attached to a certain state? Every question that pertained to what human beings were going to do in the, in, in, today and in the future uh, as, as, uh, as creatures of a planet on which no war should or must ever take place again, particularly because, of course, uh, at that moment, uh, the U.S. had the atomic bomb and very quickly Soviet Russia did, and, of course, that created the Cold War and the moment at which we realized that annihilation was possible for the first time with very little, um, potentially with very little uh, 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 trouble. And I mean, it, it, it could happen very quickly that, that it, without a UN, we could get ourselves into um, nuclear annihilation. So Eleanor's, the, the, the stakes couldn't have been higher, but the complications couldn't have been greater, which is to say 18 member states were, were, were assigned the task of coming up with a declaration, were, were worked with, uh, with each other, the representatives of each of which worked with each other on Eleanor's commission, uh, creating the document, the language, um, and 56 member states had to sign off on it once they had a proposed document. The complications in each case of the culture, the culture of each uh, country, their, their religious, their their financial, their, um, their uh, social and moral um, obligations, duties, uh, beliefs, systems, all mismatching, all had to be brought somehow into some kind of um, uh, uh, uniformity or at least a, an agreed upon structure in which we could view how human beings were going to live on the planet uh, for the foreseeable future. And that was accomplished over time in a way that Eleanor I mean, I want to say it's about listening and it's, a, it's about patience and tolerance. It's about understanding that human beings are human beings and about how limited we each are in our abilities to connect with others. And it was her absence, I think, of it was her absence of arrogance. It was her absence of of domina- of needing to dominate. She was in a very complicated place with the Soviets because they would immediately turn upon her uh, and say, we're not going to be criticized by you. Look at what you're doing in Alabama. Right. Look at what the United States is. You're having lynchings. You're lynching. Uh, there, there are lynchings of, of U.S. veterans happening right now in the state of Mississippi. How can you possibly criticize our human rights agenda? And they would try to embarrass her uh, in, 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 the, um, in the public forum of the U.N. with events that were taking place in the post-war years in, in the U.S., that she always found a way to negotiate, I think, around and with. Um, she had a very good, very clear relationship, actually, with her Soviet counterparts on certain things and was and took very little. Um, uh, she was able always, she treated them like her son, she always said. She learned from her sons uh, a, a way to, 
to, to let men be men with, without shaming or mocking or humiliating them, but putting them um, into their place when she needed to get something that needed to be done. And the trick of Eleanor Roosevelt always is, and I found that it helped me write this book, which is if you get bogged down in words as a writer, quoting and getting involved in letters and papers, you get a little lost. Everybody writing a term paper can get to this place of, oh my God, this is too many words. I did with her what people I think have been doing in the last numbers of years politically, which is what was done? What did she do? What, what was the next thing that she did? And Eleanor Roosevelt was a woman of action. And if you look at how she treated uh, the log jams and snags during the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you see that it's always moving to the next thing without necessarily resolving where we are. She would move on and in that motion, that forward motion, she would to bring the momentum and energy uh, to a new uh, chapter or a new, new se sequence and in that way would often just create momentum and she would get things done. And it was getting things done that whenever I met somebody who had actually known her, there were people who still were around when I began my research, always they, I would always say, what's the one thing I would know about Eleanor Roosevelt if she walked in the room right now or that you remember from, from being in her uh, life and in, in working with her, it was always the same answer. She got things done. She did things. It was very quick. She quickly, quickly responded and always figured out a way to do something. I want to remind everybody that we're talking with David Michaelis, who is the author of the uh, new biography of Eleanor Roosevelt entitled Eleanor, which is a very succinct and excellent descriptive title. And uh, I, you know, we I, we have a bunch of questions from people that um, I fear we're not going to get to. And David, maybe you, you'd be willing if I summarize them in an email to you, you'd give me some answers that I could put up on Facebook afterwards for people to answer their questions um, uh, about about Eleanor. Sure. I, I want to just take a few minutes uh, uh, to talk a little bit about your process and. Um, this is a hugely sprawling topic. I don't even know how you, you get a hold of a topic like this. And so I'm interested, this is your third biography. Presumably you're starting to figure it out by now uh, and, and how, how you approach it. And you did send us some pictures uh, and, and uh, I'm happy that, you know, that sort of of your notebooks and, and stuff, I'm happy to bring some of them in, but kind of give me a sense of, of, uh, of how you approach this and maybe help me show you show some of these pictures uh talk about what they are david rick rick is just trying to get ideas see so yeah i am totally it. i am totally well, doing that so i have my notebook right here and uh i am uh, uh ideas from the kids because we've done this that's the whole point of the show is to steal excuse me borrow whatever ideas we can well, I don't want to get too catch-22 about this because it gets, that, that will get all kind of uh, existential. But the, the, the very thing I was trying to do, I realized right away was impossible. And so therefore, because it was impossible, therefore I was freed from it actually taking place and never happening. So it was almost impossible to think I would get Eleanor Roosevelt this life of so many parts and so many, I mean, just from the, from the Victorian age to the atomic age and, and the numbers of people involved and the numbers of issues and the numbers of changes in her own life and even the numbers of children, I mean, six children uh, and with, with 19 marriages, just the children, and let alone her relatives and let alone when you go to the Theodore Roosevelt uh, archives, you know, and let alone the FDR archives. I realized that I was never going to get it done and therefore I was somewhat freed for a little while anyway. Um, from the pressure of thinking, oh, this will succeed. I really didn't think it was going to, um, but I didn't, of course, ever give up on that notion. It was finally the thing that allowed me to do it. The thing that finally allowed me to do it was what you see in the title itself, which is I began it as a book about Mrs. Roosevelt, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt Roosevelt. I, I, I studied her as a child of her father, a child of Theodore Roosevelt. What you're looking at there is... Um, uh, a very early a, a, a notebook of mine in which I was really trying to see her as a New Yorker and see her life in, and the Roosevelt's life in the city. And there is Lincoln's funeral, um, April 1865, uh, as it goes up Broadway. And there in the window of uh, CVS Roosevelt's house on Broadway are two little boys looking out as Lincoln's hearse goes by, Lincoln's casket goes by. 
And one of them is Theodore Roosevelt, the future 26th president of the United States, and his younger brother, Elliot, who was Eleanor's father. And there's Eleanor in the UN um, many, many years later listening. And uh, I felt that there was always a presence in the city of the Roosevelt. They, they're, they're, it's a, there's a lot of New York in the book. Uh, there is, it's an organizing principle in a way of Eleanor's life. I begin it in the city and it ends in the city. Uh, it goes back to the city on, on, in the two-way current of, of, of the Hudson River. Um, what I was talking about with one volume was what, and the impossibility of it, was that I began it as a study of Mrs. Roosevelt, who that's how I knew her. And it was only in finally, I, I kept thinking, I, my dad was uh, born in Berlin and was a scientist and lived in London for years and then in, and then in the United States. And he's a very thorough person and I tend to be sort of thorough in my research. So I want to resolve things and I want things to have conclusions. Um, none of this ever worked out that way. And Eleanor's <laughs> life itself didn't have, I thought there would be nice neat packages almost in the way some of these things would resolve. And it was really finally in accepting that they didn't resolve that way and in seeing her much more as herself, much more as a, as a woman who had complications and, and could not figure things out always and uh, who was not always um, in control of, of her life and yet was figuring out how to let go and uh, understand herself better. All of the things you do to get to know somebody as they really are, as she herself was getting to know herself as they really are, helped me kind of come to the point where I could actually call her Eleanor. I, it was a matter of some oddness to me in the beginning. I didn't know what to call her on the page. You know, it wasn't going to be Roosevelt. It wasn't going to be Mrs. Roosevelt. You can't call her Mrs. Roosevelt. What was she going to be known as in the book on the page? How would I follow her? I would be at her elbow going through things. But what would she be? Would she be Eleanor? And then finally she was. And finally I was able to do that without feeling I was being undignified with her or, or, or being opportunistic in some way about her. Um, it was sort of at first also, what is a man doing writing a woman's life? And it was sort of Madame Bovary time, you know, uh, uh, Flaubert saying Madame Bovary say moi. And I didn't want that. I didn't want people to think I was writing a book to try to figure out how a woman's mind worked um, as a man. But I also felt after a certain point that I just understood her as a person. Spending the time I spent getting to know her, um, I felt really comfortable with her after a while. And it helped me be comfortable with the long unwieldy process of writing this long life. Did you get all that, Rick? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> well, also, Simon & Schuster, um, I, uh, I, I had an editor Simon Schuster, yeah. Alice Mayhew, who, was a, who yeah. had a brilliance about uh, uh, narrative. She, she's Bob Woodward's editor. She and Stephen Ambrose. Wasn't she book. Stephen Ambrose's yeah. uh, editor? Steam, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, she began pressing me to send her chapters, and I'd never done that before. And that helped a lot because she would respond and, and uh, I was sort of sending her almost like a serial, like a Dickens serial, um, week, month to month kind of thing. I find All deadlines right. are enormously um, <laughs> helpful. helpful. If Great someone's luxury. paying you money to write something by a certain date, that is probably the best way I can actually get something written. Yep. Uh, yeah. It, you're hard pressed to find another reason um, to actually get in and sit down and do that. German thing of Sitzfleisch, just putting your ass in the chair and, and actually getting it done that day. It's, um, there's too much distraction right now. It's the hardest thing in the world right now for people, I think, to... And, yeah. and with COVID and all the rest of it, it became really difficult for people to stay focused. All right. So do I get to last, ask the last big one there, Rick? Yeah, Chris, all I right. set it all up for you, well, man. You set I'm it all right, up I'm for right me. here making it happen. All right. So stay, I want to read uh, something here. So excuse my looking down at the page, uh, but this... This comes from the book. Uh, this was 1961. As the seer of the country, mobile trustee of an atomic age superpower, and world circling investigator with an unusual range of th sympathies, Eleanor Roosevelt had on her mind the most pressing needs of democracies old and new. Yet as airtime approached for another installment of Prospects of Mankind, her monthly educational program for G WGBH TV, here was one more request. Diana Michaelis's little boy wanted something. Mrs. R glided to a full stop. Time itself stopped as the white-haired lady leaned down and looked into my eyes. I believe I breathed out two words, juicy fruit. 
She responded merrily, her, her eyes blue as gas jets, the big toothy smile luminous. I have no recollection of anything that she said. I was held close by an intense, intensely noticing gaze, which was so full of goodwill it seemed to brim out of her eyes as light. I had never seen that actual goodness flowing out of a human being, and only long afterward realized how fortunate I was to have, held, to have felt it full in the face at four. Um, so, given the time that you committed to telling her story, um, kind of uh, what lingers the most with you? And here's, of course, the obvious talk show last question. What do you think we should take from her today as we're living in 21st century America with a few difficulties on the horizon? Yeah. I mean, I think the simplest thing to take is um, kindness, of course. Uh, is, it is, she always saw it, I think, as a certain kind of magic between human beings. Uh, I think Eleanor saw democracy as a, re the, the, the part of democracy that, that she focused on was the part that doesn't necessarily go, um, doesn't, isn't about institutions being balanced by checks and balances. is isn't about the executive and the, and the judicial and the legislative branches all being balanced. It's about how human beings are treating each other, how we as, as, as citizens are treating each other. And it's about the reciprocity that democracy requires. And so in that reciprocity, is, is a, is about, it's about listening. It's about being kind. It's about um, giving the other person maybe the benefit of the doubt um, at first at, so that you can hear what they're saying. All of that is important, I think. I think she also was the daily reminder, the conscience that said, if you want to be a citizen in a democracy, you, you do have to do something for it. And I think the last four years have shown us very distinctly that we do. We have an active role to play and we have an active response and we can't sit around assuming that someone else has got this or someone else is going to do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. And she took that message every day um, to people and she gave it to people through various different media, of course. And I felt that as a, I mean, I, what I felt as a four-year-old, as my, you know, the son of, of, a, of one of Eleanor's TV producers, my mother was working with her on a program up in Boston at Waltham, Mass, at WGBH, uh, which was being broadcast from Brandeis University. And I felt from this woman a sense um, of, as I said, goodness. But what it was was a completely unconditional interest in you, uh, you the person. And I, so I think that treating people as individuals was the was the medium through which she communicated the idea that everybody is important and everybody has a role to play and the universal declaration of human rights is a document that says you are important you are somebody you have rights you are a person this is not to be taken uh with anything other than the most important um as the most important role of of uh of government and of of each of us toward each other did you, did I, I do think her? I'm going to miss her a lot. I'm going to miss <laughs> the kind of feeling I had of, with her, which was that I can get through this too. She, I think she leaves people always feeling that whatever their challenge is, whatever their misery is, whatever the world is throwing at them, they can do it. They can, they can get through this too. And I, and I think people reach out for hope. And I think she gave it to people. And she gives it, she certainly... I was terrified that I wasn't going to actually ever finish. I was terrified that uh, by a lot of things that I wasn't going to get things right, that I would forget things. All. But I always felt with her that I would be able to get, a, get through it and that it would be enough, that she lived in a world where good was good enough. And I don't think she was a person who looked to people and said, you know, be excellent or be best. She said, and by the way, she loved Christmas, uh, <laughs> loved it, adored it, which is a very telling thing about her. Uh, that she loved Christmas and started shopping in January, January 1st right. every year. She began her Christmas shopping for the following year. But she was not expecting you to be a genius. She was expecting you to be your, your, your best self, to be yourself as who you were, and she wanted you to be yourself. And that's, that kind of goodness is that feeling that you get from a grandmother or an aunt or a mother or, or you know, obviously father, uncle, and, and brother and so forth. It's someone who is in your favor, someone who wants you to succeed and do your best. And that's who she was. Well, David Michaelis, thank you so much. And uh, as a former resident of Waltham, thanks for telling a story that took place <laughs> in Waltham. Love Waltham. And uh, I want to just say that David, again, is the author of the new biography, uh, Eleanor, 
and uh, uh, you know, and somebody's. I said saw somebody was buying it on Amazon. Yeah, definitely go do that. And David, thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour. It's really been very illuminating. It's been wonderful, David. Really Total enjoyed pleasure. That. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you so really much. Fun. Good luck with everything. I, Look forward to the tour. It's, I look forward to Nor- Normandy yeah. to the Rhine. Sign you We'd up. Love you know, to I, have I really, to seriously, have I can't wait. I'm sure, the folks from the tour company are on the line. Uh, they'll they'll probably be calling you within the hour. So. <laughs> good, good. All right. No, I'm, Thank I you. can't wait. Sign me up for the first one. Great. Take care, David. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, there we go, Chris. Uh, we can pass that along to you, Kieran and Edie, and uh, and uh, and be moving on on that. So so I have a. a um, you know, a, a kind of a history all around us related to okay. this. Um, and you may remember uh, back in 2019, we were in Normandy. We were at the 75th anniversary of the um, of, of D-Day there in Normandy. And then I came home and yep. uh, on my way back stopped in Hyde Park uh, oh. at the FDR uh, house and museum there to do a presentation. Uh, on a certain topic, which I wouldn't dare mention uh, right now. And, no good. Yeah, no. Um, moving right along. No, no, I'll leave it alone. And so, uh, and so, uh, and but I had a moment there to to commune with Eleanor Roosevelt. And luckily for the both of us, there's a photograph uh-huh. that I can use to share this moment with you, and so that you can see. <laughs> <laughs> that Eleanor Roosevelt was also a big fan of the Ghost Army. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, so uh, cheers to that. You turned her to stone. You turned her to stone. I did. I also, in that uh, uh, statue, Franklin is right on the other side. We have just cut him right out of the photo there. So uh, that is my my connection for everybody there. So next week, Chris, we have uh, uh, another terrific and very different uh, topic. Uh, and tell us the book. The book is called Endel Street. Yes. Uh, and it's suffragette surgeons in World War One. What what is this story about? A little bit. It's, it's a it's a fascinating story. Um, it is the story of uh, two. Uh, society women in Britain who uh, decide that uh, medical attention is to the boys in khaki is not good enough, so they they go through a lot of hurdles and they set up the first uh, w- hospital in Great Britain, uh, staffed entirely by women during the Great War. Um, everybody who works there um, is, uh, is is a woman. But what's more interesting is that they really push the envelope in terms of treatment of battlefield casualties uh, and they developed the reputation as being one of the best uh, hospitals uh, with the most successful outcomes and so it's the story of what they go through to to build the Endel Street Hospital. Wow, it, that sounds amazing and something that I know zero about. So You'll know more next week. All right. Um, well, Chris, another fantastic hour and uh, I think it's time for us to wrap it up. So thank you everybody for joining us and I'm glad we could get as many of your questions in as we did and we'll try to get some answers on those other ones and thank you for being with us today. Thanks so much guys. Be safe.